Evening folks. Well, as you undoubtedly know by now, we're thinking about the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the early church. And, and so far in this study, we've considered four things. Firstly, we took the time to reflect on Jesus's promise to send the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1. And in doing that, we saw that one of the, the, the dominant roles of the Spirit in our lives is to empower us to be his witnesses in the world. Secondly, we considered how spirit-filled believers will always have the desire to be committed and devoted to the life of the local church. And then thirdly, we thought about how the spirit develops community among believers. And so as he sanctifies God's people, the result is a, a fellowship that knows growing togetherness, kindness and closeness. And then last week we considered how such a church will not only know great joy in the Lord, but they'll also see their witness have a, a growing impact in the community around them for Christ. Well, tonight we're going to really expand on that last point by thinking about how spirit-filled believers will be marked by boldness in their gospel proclamation. But before we read our passage in Acts chapter 4, let me just give you a little bit of context to bring us up to speed. So back in chapter 3, we read the amazing account of the lame beggar being healed. And this miraculous event was then followed by Peter boldly proclaiming the gospel in Solomon's portico, where we read that another 5,000 people believed in Christ. And let's remember that this figure only takes into account the men who believed. So there was probably a, a, a lot more. But this act of healing and the subsequent proclamation of the gospel that followed, it resulted in opposition from the religious leaders. Peter and John were arrested and placed in custody. Then on the following day, the Jewish council, they gathered together and they demanded to know by what power or by what name did they heal this lame man. Well, it's here that I want us to break into the text in chapter 4 at verse 8. So let's read God's word together. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today, concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognised that they had been with Jesus. And this is God's word. Isn't it amazing how bold we can be when we receive some sort of good news? And so maybe we've welcomed a new baby into the family, or we've got a new job, or we've won a competition. Perhaps our, our child has started walking or talking, or they've passed their driving test or absolutely aced their exams. And, is, and, and in those moments, we're not only quick to text and ring people to tell them the good news, but in this day and age of social media, we're also very quick to put it online for the world to see, even though we rarely see the majority of our friends on our social media pages. It's almost as if we can't help ourselves. We just want to declare to the world that this good thing has happened to us. But why are we not like that when it comes to the gospel? 
and the salvation we know in Jesus Christ. I mean, this is the greatest news ever. The best thing that has and ever will happen to us. But instead of being bold to share that good news with those around us, quite often we're marked by nothing more than timidity. In other words, we're silent and we don't share it with others. Yet as we look at the early church, there's absolutely no doubt that they were always bold in their witness. And the reason for that was because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So with this in mind, let's consider this passage before us tonight. Firstly, in verses 8 to 12, I want us to think about the boldness of Peter. As we approach these verses, it's important for us to remember that Peter and John were standing before the same ruling body that had condemned Jesus, the Sanhedrin. And so they found themselves in a somewhat precarious situation. It was entirely possible that they could face the same outcome as Jesus. Now just imagine the, the weight of that. Therefore, you, you wouldn't be surprised if they were filled with fear and scared into silence as a result. By all means, that's the, the natural human response to, to such a situation as this. Yet look at what we read at the beginning of verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. Here we see that Peter was filled with the Spirit and as a result he boldly proclaimed the gospel in spite of the danger that he found himself in. And as you glance through what Peter said, you'll see that there's absolutely no hint of fear or denial. Rather, Peter boldly proclaims that it was in the name of Jesus that this man had been healed. In fact, Peter boldly confronts his listeners with the fact that they had crucified the Christ, that they had rejected the cornerstone, God's promised Messiah. And as a result, Peter challenged them to repent of their sin by boldly declaring in verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Just pause for a moment and take in the boldness of Peter's words. Not only is he saying that this lame man was physically healed in the name of Jesus. But he's also declaring that spiritual healing is only possible in the name of Jesus, the one they rejected, crucified and killed. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, this is the same ruling body that had conspired to, to have Jesus killed. So there's no doubt that they could have done the same to Peter. Yet he stands before them and he boldly proclaims Jesus as saviour of the world. Now, how is that possible? What had caused this man, who, let's remember, had denied Jesus three times only a matter of weeks ago, to now boldly proclaim him as Lord and Saviour? Well, look again at verse 8, where we read, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. You see, Peter was still the same person who had denied Jesus three times. But there was one big difference in his life. He now had the Holy Spirit dwelling within him, just as Jesus had promised. And as he was increasingly filled with the Spirit, he boldly proclaimed the gospel. So what does it mean, therefore, to be filled with the Spirit? Well, of course, we, we all have the Spirit dwelling within us as Christians. But the Apostle Paul helps us uh, to, to understand what it means to be filled with the Spirit by providing a helpful illustration in Ephesians 5. He says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So here we find Paul presenting a contrast between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit. So think about someone who's drunk. We often refer to them as being under the influence. 
And this results in a change of behaviour. Being drunk changes the way a person thinks, the way they speak and the way they act. And so Paul is essentially drawing a contrast here by saying that instead of being under the influence of wine, believers must always be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. It means to be controlled by him. You see, this is where we can often go wrong. Sometimes we think that being filled with the Spirit means that uh, I suppose every now and again we, we need a top up of him. In the same way as you would go to the, the, the petrol station to, to top up your car when it's low on fuel. But that's the wrong way of thinking because the Spirit isn't some sort of liquid that we're to fill our glasses with. Rather, the Spirit is a person. And so when Paul commands us to be filled with the Spirit, he's not speaking in terms of quantity. Rather, he's speaking in terms of influence. You see, here's the thing we must understand. Every true believer in Christ has the Holy Spirit dwelling within their hearts in all his fullness. And so it's impossible to fill up on the Spirit because we already have him in all his fullness. Instead, being filled with the Spirit simply means to be increasingly in submission to his control and influence. This is why it's an ongoing command. We're to keep on being filled with the Spirit because we're so prone to slip back into our old ways of the flesh. Well, how do we do this? Well, it's really simple. We ensure that we're always in submission to the Spirit's influence by letting the Word of Christ dwell within us richly. You see, as we feed on God's word, our desires and our lives are progressively changed by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. This is where the the comparison with drunkenness comes to light. You see, being filled with wine results in a change of behaviour. People have a a lack of self-control and are led into debauchery as a result. Being filled with the Spirit, on the other hand, It leads to a change of behaviour as well, but it doesn't lead to debauchery, but rather it leads to godliness and boldness. You see, Peter was not some sort of robot whom the Spirit took complete control of so that he would only speak the gospel in boldness. Rather, he was a man who was living in submission to the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so what we see here is Peter acting in accordance with his own heartfelt desire to glorify God through the proclamation of the gospel. In fact, this boldness is is always the result of being filled with the Spirit. I mean, if you work your way through the book of Acts, in fact, I'd encourage you to do this, you'll find that every time believers were filled with the Spirit, living in submission to him, It always resulted in bold proclamation of the gospel. Now that shouldn't surprise us. Because let's remember what Jesus taught us in John 15. That the Spirit's predominant role is to bear witness to Christ. And so if we're filled with the Spirit, then our desire will also be to bear witness to Christ. Well, bringing this into the contemporary setting, let's ask ourselves, why do so many believers lack boldness when it comes to the gospel? Why are so many of us driven by fear and scared into silence as a result? Well, it has to be because we're not being increasingly filled with the Spirit every day. In other words, we're not truly living in submission to his influence Because we're not ensuring that the word of Christ is dwelling within us richly. Yes, we may be reading God's word, but we're not walking in obedience to it. 
And so we're quenching the work of the Spirit in our lives by not longing to be changed by God's Word. Now that's challenging, isn't it? In fact, it should cause us to, to examine our hearts to see where we truly are at with the Lord. But listen, I know what you're like. I know what I'm like. We're very good at making excuses when it comes to personal evangelism, so we feel better about ourselves. I'm not an outgoing individual. I'm an introvert, and so I couldn't strike up conversations with people about Jesus. I don't know my Bible well enough, and so I couldn't answer everyone's questions. Ever made those excuses? Well, if that's the case, listen carefully as we move on from the boldness of Peter to think about the shock of the council in verse 13. Look at what we read. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognised that they had been with Jesus. Do you notice that? The council are amazed because these men are common and uneducated. You see, Peter and John were fishermen. They weren't scholars in the scriptures, nor had they received the proper training in rabbinic theology. Yet they not only spoke with great authority, but they also spoke with theological reasoning. You see, this is where all of our excuses of not being outgoing enough or knowing enough of the Bible crumble into insignificance. These men had proved on previous occasions that they were timid and fearful. Likewise, we're told here that they were uneducated, yet they still spoke in boldness. What was the difference in their lives? Well, as we've considered already, they were filled with the Spirit. They were living in submission to his influence in their lives. But we're actually given another reason in this verse. We're told that the council recognised that they had been with Jesus. And so as they loved him and as they grew in their love for him, they wanted to serve him with their lives. Well, every Christian is commanded to bear witness to Christ. And to help us in that task, we have been blessed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so our excuses that we're shy or that our Bible knowledge isn't great really aren't acceptable. We have the supernatural Spirit of God dwelling within us. Is he not able to work wonders and to use us in the proclamation of the gospel in spite of the fact we're shy? Of course he is. And so the reason we're not bold in our witness is not because of our personality or our lack of knowledge. It has to be because we're not being increasingly filled with the Spirit every day. You see, here's the thing that's clearly presented in Scripture. Boldness always springs forth from something that is happening deep within our hearts. What I mean by that is it doesn't come naturally to us. Instead, it's worked within us as we fall deeper in love with Jesus and our desires are increasingly conformed with his. This will always lead to boldness in our proclamation of the gospel because this is the heart of God. He wants to save people from their sins. And so let's stop making excuses. Let's stop trying to justify why we're not bold in our gospel proclamation. It's not because we're introverts or because we're shy or because our, our knowledge of the Bible isn't great. It's because we're not filled with the Spirit. We're not walking in submission to his influence day by day. This could be because we're not reading or walking in obedience to God's word as we should. We're not being inwardly transformed by it. Or it could be because we're quenching or grieving the spirit in our lives and we need to repent. 
But one thing's for sure. It's not that the Spirit is unable or unwilling to use us. And so may that challenge your heart as it challenges mine tonight. And may we respond now in heartfelt and repentant prayer. Thank you.